By his late teens, Bobby Fischer was the top chess player in the United States, and he was already using tactics of intimidation. Chess was not for him a form of play as much as it was a sport. He trained himself to win, physically, psychologically, and in terms of his chess knowledge. He towers over you, flashing blue eyes, looking around, and if you'd make some threat which to him seemed childish, he would kind of like snicker or scoff at that. Mark Tylenoff said that he was Achilles without an Achilles heel. He, it was like a wall was advancing on you. You just felt helpless. But Bobby's success came at a price. As his chess skills improved, his social skills deteriorated. He didn't have many friends. His life became chess. Chess became his life. If you were in conversation with him over dinner, uh, you would look glance round to find that he'd taken out his pocket set uh, and was playing. Chess and me, you know, it's like it's hard to take him apart, you know. Just like my alter ego, you know. People outside of the world of chess, he would refer to them as weakies or fish. They didn't have anything to offer. What has chess done to your social life? Do you get yeah. a chance to go out? Not too much. No. Do you have a girl? No. Uh, he's a lonely person, and the chess gives him the companionship that he lacks. Bobby slept during the day and studied chess and listened to the radio at night. He found a captivating voice in Herbert Armstrong, founder of the Worldwide Church of God. All of the great cities are going to be leveled and destroyed. I'm telling you that a time more terrifying than anything that ever happened is soon going to happen in this world. Herbert W. Armstrong had the largest radio and TV audience in the nation in the 60s. And his son, Garner Ted Armstrong, both were very charismatic speakers, motivational type people. It was a fundamentalist sect uh, and that also had uh, Saturday as the Sabbath, which was sort of unusual for a Christian sect. After studying many religions, and I mean many, he felt that we were the closest to the truth at that time. He was hooked into it. From 1957 to 1967, he won eight U.S. championships. With each success, Bobby's ego swelled. He began to make demands, exerting control. Boards had to be so, the pieces had to be so, the audience had to be kept back from the game, the prize money had to be doubled. Conditions have been like in the dark ages, you know, horrible lighting, chandelier type lighting, when obviously if you're going to concentrate for five hours, you need the most soft, kind of <clears throat> bright type fluorescent lighting that you can get. He made life hell for tournament organizers, and a couple of times this led to showdowns and he refused to compromise. In 67, despite leading the World Championship qualifying tournament, Fisher walked out midway after a series of arguments with tournament officials. Bobby had to forfeit, so Bobby left. He played one of the great tournaments of his life and then he drops out. Because he wasn't getting his request. Once he realized he was leaving, he sent a message to the U.S. Embassy saying that he wanted a nice roomy helicopter to take him <laughs> to the airport. All the dignitaries are there, everybody's there. It's all set. There's only one person missing, Bobby Fischer. The World Chess Championship is a three-year cycle. The world's top players compete in a series of regional tournaments called the Interzonals until the field is narrowed to eight. In the candidates round, the final eight compete for the right to take on the reigning champ. When the cycle for the 1972 title rolled around, Bobby Fischer was at the top of his game. He easily won the Interzonals, finishing with seven consecutive wins. Then he made history. He has to play a series of candidates matches, three matches. The first one, he plays Mark Taimanov, wonderful, brilliant Soviet grandmaster. He beats him 6-0. The Soviets can't believe this. The match was over and Taimanov got up and said, well, I can always play the piano. <laughs> then he plays Bent Larsen, one of the great chess players as well, Danish grandmaster. 
He beat him six to nothing. You know, that's like knocking out Muhammad Ali with one hand tied behind your back. It can't be done. Then he plays Tigran Petrosian, smashes him as well. The chess world had never seen a series of games quite like this. Fischer earned the right to challenge the reigning world champ, 35-year-old Russian Boris Spassky. Spassky was a product of the Soviet chess machine, the chess Soviet school. He had training, he had support, he had everything that a chess player dreams of. The Soviets had dominated the World Chess Championship since World War II. Chess was how they proved their intellectual superiority over capitalism. The Soviets have always used chess as propaganda. Their idea was communism is the best government social system. It produces the smartest men and women, so naturally we win the world's chess championship. For years, Bobby had complained that the Soviets had conspired to retain the title. You sound a little angry when you talk about the Russians and their chess. That's right, yeah. Well, they've held my title for about 10 years. I look at it. This is Bobby, the lone American hero, riding out to confront the massed ranks of the great, previously all-conquering chess machine. The Cold War showdown sparked spectacular international interest. Iceland earned the right to host by offering a record purse of $125,000. But Bobby never signed the contract, and at the last moment, had second thoughts. He wanted more money. This was a last-minute demand, and nobody in Iceland was going to meet it. I thought that Bobby Fischer would like to become the world chess champion, and I couldn't believe that he would walk away from it. This was the highest prize money ever. Thousands of fans and journalists descended upon Reykjavik, but when the opening ceremonies took place, one man was missing. There's the world champion himself, Boris Spassky. There's the American ambassador. There's the president of Iceland. There's only one empty chair, and it is, of course, the challenger. Where is the challenger? The challenger's in New York City, uh, renegotiating the agreement. If Mr. Fisher has a moral to pass on, it is that the important thing in the game is not in winning, but in getting the highest percentage of the gate money. Michael Nicholson, ITN, sitting where Mr. Fisher should have been in Iceland tonight. How far would Bobby push his demands, and would it cost him his dream?